Thanks so much, uh, Paul. It is an absolute privilege to be with you all tonight and to break God's word on the Lord's Day tonight. Please turn your Bibles to Psalm 13. Psalm 13, we're going to be there. Psalm 13, it's a brief psalm. There's a lot of content in this psalm. It's a great psalm. So psalm 13 is a fundamentally a psalm of lament, and as we go through the psalm, it's really important that we remember uh, what the psalms are generally all about. The psalm is about the Christian life. The psalm reflects to us what it is to become a mature Christian, to have a mature, emotional Christian life. It reflects to us how we're supposed to worship God. It reflects to us the internal life that we're supposed to have before God. It shows us, therefore, the internal life of, again, the mature Christian. And it models to us a lot of things. It models to us prayer. It models to us worship. It models to us how we are supposed to sing, how we're supposed to conduct ourselves before God and before other people as representatives of God. So remember now that Psalm 13, verses 1 to 6, is a psalm of lament. It's a psalm of lament. It calls for God attention and action precisely because it's a psalm of lament. It's a psalm sat by a psalmist who's facing terrible questions, deep anguish, deep sorrow, profound anxiety. And it's modeling us to us how are we supposed to pray? How are we supposed to conduct ourselves before God as we are lamenting? How are we supposed to lament well? And a lot of that, uh, I divide this psalm into two parts. Uh, verses 1, 2, 3, and 4 is the first part. And verses 5 and 6 is the second part. Verses 1, 2, 4 talks about the lament itself. It calls God attention, again. And it calls God to action. The psalmist brings God's attention and calls him to action. That's verses 1 to 4, the lament itself. And verses 5 to 6, we're going to see, is going to be the solution to the lament. It's a solution to the lament. It's kind of the turning point there. And there are going to be three points that I want to bring us, uh, to us tonight through this psalm. First point is the legitimacy of lament. The second point is direction of lament. And the third is the power of the lament. Legitimacy of lament, the direction of our lament, and the power of the lament. With that said, let us bring tonight before God in prayer. Father, we thank you for this privilege to come before you. We are an undeserving people. We are sinful, and we are such a wrongdoers before you. We've broken your law, Father, but you've called us worthy. You've called us your sons and daughters in Jesus Christ. We're reminded of your grace tonight and every Lord's Day. We're reminded that you have come to us before we even looked for you. That while we were still enemies, we were reconciled before you in Jesus Christ, our Lord. So we pray, Father, that as we go through this psalm, that we would see not only ourselves better and you better, Father, we'll see Christ in it. And we'd be moved to obedience, not merely uh, agreeing to this intellectually, not only agreeing to this with our heads, but also be fluid in our hearts so that we may be embodied uh, in our obedience for you. Pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So the first point is the legitimacy of lament. To understand the importance of the psalm, to understand the weight of the psalm, we need to understand that the Christian life is not against lament. The Christian life is a holistic life. The Christian life understands that our affections is a part of who we are. That our emotions is not something to be subverted or muted in some sort of transcendental spiritual manner for a Christian. So the Christian life understands that we are created with body, soul, and spirit. That our affections is an integral part of who we are should be cultivated before God in obedience to Him. Lament, therefore, is a legitimate part of the Christian life. We should expect this to be the case. If we become a Christian, things don't go any easier for us. Before we were Christians, right, the only enemy that we have is God Himself, and it's a pretty good enemy. He wants our good. He loves us. He calls us to be with Him. But after we become Christians, our enemies are threefold. Our enemies are the flesh, the devil, right? And our own sins, the world. And, and these provoke us from all sides. And therefore, as we become Christians, we should expect that 
We would face adversity. We should expect that when we go through this life, we're going through it as a wilderness people. First Peter calls us an elect exile to visit. We've been called out of this world. We've been called to resist the tendencies of this world, the cultures of our days, so that we may not face God in obedience and constantly do all these things. So we should expect that things would become a little bit more difficult when we become Christians. And so lament is an integral part of the Christian life. And we, we see this all the way through the psalm. Look at verse 13, I mean, chapter 13, verse 1. It says, How long, O Lord, will you forget me forever? There is a tone of real sadness, of real anxiety for this, that brings ourselves before God, and we're asking God to consider ourselves. Will you forget me forever? And the uncertainty here is remarkable. How long, God? Will this duration take forever? I don't know how long this is going to last. This is an indefinite amount of time, and God says that this is a model for us. That in certain moments, in certain moments where we're facing real adversity, we're facing really tough times, we should come before God and lament. There's a legitimacy to this. You know, we see this all the way throughout the Bible, and a great example of this is Jesus Christ Himself. And the Christian life is a real holistic life. If the Christian life really takes our emotions into account, it understands that in certain situations, it's called forth for, for a certain response in our part that fits that situation. You know, when we're walking toward the sunset, for example, and we see the beauty of it, maybe crying on the beach one day, and we see the beauty of the sunset, and it moves us completely, and even provokes thoughts of God. But if we're Walking past the sunset, and we have a friend right next to us, and he's completely unmoved. We're in awe, we see our friend, we see the same sunset before us, and we see that our friend is completely unmoved before the sun that is before us. There's a part of us that intuitively feel that there's something wrong about that. We want to tell him, wake up, consider this beauty before you. Consider what is before you. Wake up to this remarkable showcasing of God's beauty and nature. Feel it. Be in awe of it. That's the appropriate response to the sunset. It is not an appropriate response to stand there completely unaffected, completely unmoved. And we see this in Jesus' life as well. It is very remarkable to me. When you go to John chapter 11, and then Jesus goes before the tomb of Lazarus. Lazarus has just passed away. And Jesus goes over there, and of course he knows Lazarus, and he knows the family and friends family. They're all weeping, they're completely sad, and Jesus walks in, and everybody's saying to Jesus, what did they say? Lord, if only you were here. If only you were here, this would not have happened. Lazarus would still be alive. And Jesus walks in, and finally he sees Mary. Mary is also completely distraught. And Mary leads him to this tomb, and Mary starts weeping, and she repeats the same thing. If only you were here, Lord, Lazarus would still be alive. And Jesus says, I want to see him. And he sees him, he sees the tomb. What does he do? It says that he was deeply moved. He came to that situation, it says he was deeply moved, and he wept. He wept. We know how the story goes. We know that Jesus is going to raise him up back to life. It's going to be an amazing miracle in front of everybody. Now, if you and I were in that situation, and we were Jesus, we had all the power in the world to raise him up. We weren't taken by surprise of his death. We knew that we came in, but we knew what we were exactly about to do at that point. We knew that we were going to raise Lazarus back to life. How would you kind of walk in? Here's how we would walk in. We would walk in, feeling a little bit excited even. All these people are weeping, and we're like, oh, wait till we, sh- wait till we see this. This is an amazing miracle that I'm about to show everybody. You gotta come in, you may even feel a little bit smug, a little bit prideful. Oh, you don't know what's about to happen. Wait till you see this. This is a weekly tragedy. And you won't shed a single tear. And we just conduct the miracle, walk away with all sorts of vainglory. But that's not what Jesus did. Jesus came to the situation. He wasn't taken by surprise. He 
He knew exactly what was going on. He knew exactly what he was about to do. He had all the power in the world to do it because he was God himself. But what did Jesus do? He saw the situation he was in. He wept. He didn't say, this is nothing. Wait till you see what I'm about to do. He didn't suppress those emotions. As if it didn't mean anything. He knew that the appropriate response in a funeral was grieving. And so the question about if it is a holistic life, response fittingly and accordingly to whatever situation that it is in, is joy and awe when you're before the sunset, and is grieving and sorrow when you're before real tragedies that are truly meaningful. And God cares. God kind of stands. And if Jesus is the real example of the perfect human being, if Jesus was truly perfect, he exemplified to us what a truly mature emotional life should be like for Christians. We completely struggle with that, don't we? We struggle with lament, right? I, I grew up in a Chinese Indonesian home, and we completely do not get legitimacy of lament. We completely don't get it. You know, we make fun of it in a lot of ways, right? We say, oh, we grew up, my mom never hugged me once, or something like that, you know? <laughs> we just don't know how to show our affections to people. Um, because it, 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 it's also wrong, it feels wrong in a way, in our culture, to show your affections, especially if it makes you look weak. You have to also project your best self to people, because in Chinese philosophy, what matters is what is seen, what matters is what's most immediately tangible, what matters is what is external. They're very uh, pragmatic, it's a very pragmatic philosophy. And so we grew up, you know, we're always told, you know, don't show that. Just make sure you project the best self. What matters is how you appear to people. So in, in, in you know, in Indonesia, and especially Chinese Indonesian circles, we have this term called uh, image management. You gotta make sure you image yourself well to other people. You gotta project your best self at all times. Otherwise, you're gonna look weak. Never cry in front of other people. Never show your crown of thorns to other people. That's just weakness. It's not legitimate to do so. And that's completely contrary to the gospel. And it's a Western form of it as well, right? I, I watched Magnificent Seven just a few weeks ago. You know, the great Western, right? It's a remake of, a, of an old classic. Denzel Washington is in it, right? He's so cool. So I lost count of how many times Denzel Washington in that movie with Chris Pratt, right, and Ethan Hawke, they would blow something up, and then this explosion appears behind them, and they just walk away calmly. <laughs> As if nothing happened. As if nothing clearly happened. And what's, what's that projecting to us? That's projecting to us, you know what's real maturity? You know what's real masculinity? This is what it looks like. It doesn't look like you're scared when the bullets are flying around you. It doesn't look like you're weeping when you see all these dead around you. It looks like walking away in complete confidence as if nothing happened because you're completely unaffected. You're stoked. It has so much more with Western secularism than it does with the gospel. And this, uh, as weird as it is, but it's a Christian form of this as well. There's a completely a Christian form of this as well. We come to church on Sunday, let's face it, let's be honest with ourselves, right? We dread that feeling right after the Sunday service is over, and we have to go grab coffee, and there's going to be some church small talk. How are you doing this week? Oh, I'm good. I'm good. Look, everybody says they're good. Nobody says, I'm thinking about a hundred different things. So I couldn't get any sleep last night. I was worried about this. I was anxious about this. As if we come to church to project that we come precisely because we're strong. And if somebody after a church service comes to us and begins with this line, how long, O oh Lord, how long, brother? I think God has forgotten about me. What are we going to say to him? Don't you remember before we get to war, man? Don't be anxious. Have, have more faith. Have more faith. Where is your faith? There must be. You sound like one of Joe's friends, right? It's almost as if you're truly a Christian. We're not really going to struggle with that. It's almost as if we come to church precisely to project our best selves. As if it's a badge of honor that we come because we've had a good week or something like that. But the song goes completely against that. It understands that we lament. And, and just take a look at the severity of this lament. Right? How long will it really forget me forever? Notice, notice how many times the psalmist says me, 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 and me. 
And this is going to be our response to that, that's, that, that person who comes to us in struggle. This, look, Psalm 13, verse 1. It says, How long, O Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide, will you hide your face from me? How long must I take up in my soul, in my heart? How long shall my enemy be exalted over me? How self centered is that we might think? Get your mind away from yourself and bring it back to God. Our drowning patience. We're very patient with ourselves. When these sort of thoughts come into our heads, we don't let ourselves breathe. In fact, you know, I think the word sort of de depression and sorrow is depression over our depression. Right? We get depressed precisely because we've been feeling depressed. There must be something wrong with me. I thought I was a mature Christian. I've been a Christian for 50 years, maybe. I shouldn't feel this way. And then we get even more depressed. We get this big cycle that just keep coming down. But this song is projecting to us something again. Of course, there is a grotesque form of self absorption that we want to avoid. And it's so very easy to get into that kind of mode where we are just absorbing ourselves, thinking about ourselves, anxious precisely because we're not thinking about God. There is a form of self absorption that's done. What this song is telling us is, however, there are moments where it's completely appropriate, where you come before God and you consider yourself before Him. Bring to him all of your baggage, all of your struggles, and God wants to listen. John Calvin, in his preface to uh, the Psalms, I think felt this. He wrote a commentary on almost every single book of the Bible. He wrote a classic, right, the Calvin Institutes, right, the Institutes of the Christian Religion, that, that tells us the summary of the Reformed Christian faith. Wrote all his commentaries, wrote that uh, beautiful piece of work, and not once really do you see a glimpse of Calvin talking about himself in any of Much unlike our evangelical books today, right? Not once do you see Calvin written for in some kind of an excursus talking about himself or his struggles or about his autobiographical information. But suddenly you get to the Psalms. And by the way, I, I think. I think Calvin understood that it's so easy to fall into self absorption. Uh, Calvin understood that it's so easy for us to just focus on ourselves that we forget about God, that he knew he didn't want to talk about himself. He knew that he wanted people to know God. He didn't want people to know Calvin. He wanted people to learn about God when they read Calvin. And that's why he didn't talk about himself. But, but in the preface to the Psalms, there's one spot. Calvin didn't only call us out a mirror to our souls. It forced us out to, to consider ourselves before God, to reflect upon our lives before God. Calvin suddenly broke forth into praise, and what did he do? He talked about his own conversion. Suddenly, in the middle of his preface to his commentary, he talked about himself, in other words. And what did he say? Um, it's this beautiful quote. He says, By subtle concession, God subdued and reduced me to docility. My soul, which was completely hardened against him, more than those who would expect of the youthful years. In other words, in introducing these psalms, Calvin felt absolutely compelled to consider himself before God, to reflect upon the past, to consider upon his own sins. To consider how God has brought him all the way to here now. So there is an appropriate place for us to bring before God who we are, to reflect upon who we are, precisely because God wants to listen. And that's not more the severity of this lament and the legitimacy of this lament goes even further. Look at the second line here. How long will you hide your face from me? How long will you hide your face from me? Not only is the psalmist Worried that this will last forever. There's this deep anxiety in the psalmist, not knowing what the future holds for him. But, but verse 1b, second part here, has this provocative line. How long will you hide your face from me? And that's a really profound line in the Old Testament. That the face of God in the Old Testament, you see and hear this every week on Sunday in the benediction. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine. This number is six. And the face of God all the way throughout the Old Testament, the whole Bible, is, is 
the symbolic uh, uh, articulation of God's favor and presence, God's blessing upon one's life. God's face, when it's shining upon you, is telling us that He is present with you, He is for you, He's favorable for you, and nothing will come against you precisely because the Lord is with you. And this is why we say it every Sunday. The benediction is important because at the end of the Lord's day every Sunday, we're commissioned to go back to the world with the confidence that God's face is for us. It's shining behind us so we can face the world again. And the psalmist is saying, I don't feel God's presence. I don't feel God's favor. God is not with me. And this coupling of the face of God on the one hand and the hiding of God's face here, this, this phrase, hiding your face, it appears in all the most uh, darkest places in the Old Testament. It appears in Genesis 4, 14. This is the testimony of Cain after God confronts him for killing Abel. Here's what Cain says. This is the phrase there. Genesis 4, 14. He says, From your face I shall be hidden. I shall be a fugitive and a wonder on the earth. From your face I shall be hidden. In other words, Cain realizes what he's done. God confronts him, and he knows that whatever he's done has, has provoked God's anger. And Cain now understands that God's face will be hidden from him. Here's the result. I will be a fugitive and a wonder on the earth. If God is not with me, I will feel completely alone and stranded on this earth. And it shows up again even more drastically in Deuteronomy 31, 17 to 20. And there, it's all about the covenant stipulations of, of, of God to Israel. And God is saying, if you break my covenant, I will surely hide my face from you. I will surely leave you. And there will be no peace in this land. So those two examples, Genesis 4, 14, and Deuteronomy 31, 17 to 20, that phrase is found, God hiding his face, and it's always in the context of unfaithfulness to God. And God's response to that, and hiding his face, hiding his favor. <coughs> Whatever the psalmist is facing here, this is not merely an existential crisis. This is not merely him coming before God and feeling alone or, or anxious. He is coming before God, and he's coming before God with a sense of dread and guilt. Dread and guilt. Of course, we're going to see that uh, this is as a result of enemies accusing of him, enemies prevailing over him, enemies, enemies bringing false charges against him so that his conscience is completely tied to it. But still, notice and just feel the fact that the psalmist is saying there are legitimate moments in the Christian life where accusations will come before you, and you will feel the weight of them. And you feel that in a lot of them, even if you're wrongly charged, God's face has been hidden from you. And so verse 2 is the direct result, isn't it? How long must it be counsel in my soul and have sorrow in the heart of the day? And that word sorrow can be translated grief or anguish. In light of the psalmist's understanding that God is away from him, naturally, he will feel completely alone. Any rupture in a vertical relationship always ends up in a horizontal rupture as well, doesn't it? If you feel that God is not for you, you will feel that the whole world is crashing under you, and you feel completely alone. Here's what the psalmist is saying. I've been alone with my thoughts. I've been having sorrow in my heart. I have nobody else to turn to the world. Where do I go? Where do I go? So that's the first point, the, the legitimacy of lament. To understand this, we need to understand that it is legitimate for us to lament. Be patient. The best form of counseling when people are lament and grieving is to let them grieve. Be patient. Second point, um, the direction of our lament. Who do we turn to when we face moments of lament, when we face moments of sorrow and grief and anguish? Who do we turn to? And notice what the psalm says. And the psalm here is considering that he has an enemy. The enemy is exalting over him, probably in the form of those accusations that I mentioned. And notice here that the enemy is multifaceted, right? The enemy is singular in, uh, in verse 2 there. How long shall my enemy be exalted over me? But at the same time, um, at the end of uh, verse 4, 
it says that his foes have been rejoicing because he's shaken. So there's enemy in the singular and there are foes in the plural. And commentators disagree on what kind of enemy the psalmist has here in mind. Is this enemy simply death itself? Are the enemies real people that are trying to bring false charges against them or attacking them in some physical way? Or is this enemy the devil himself, the evil one, the enemy? the most ultimate singular form. And commentators disagree about it. I think they disagree about it precisely because the psalm kind of leaves it open. It's kind of vague. And that's because sometimes all three can be present. And in the midst of this turmoil, of great loneliness, of feeling that God is abandoning him, abandoning him, and feeling that all these enemies are coming against him, what does the psalmist do? Who does he turn to? First person in yes. How long, O oh Lord? <coughs> God is the person that he turns to. When we're feeling completely abandoned by God, it is not a reason for us to turn further away from him, but it's precisely the reason to turn back for him to. God is the direction towards which our lament is supposed to be directed. God is the one that we turn to in moments like these things. We don't run to anything else, and these are because of three sub-reasons, right? The direction of lament is to turn towards God because he is Lord, he is Yahweh. And that word in the caps, right? It's, it's, it's Yahweh. He is the personal God who covenants with Israel. He's the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He's the God who showed up to Moses in the burning bush. He's the God who says, I am who I am before Moses. But that sovereignty doesn't limit God. In his sovereignty, God covenants with his people. That grounds the direction of our lament. This is precisely why we need to go back to God. Because He is the God who covenants with us. He is the God who's condescended to relate with us. He is the God that we call by name. And we feel we have the privilege to come to Him and to call Him by name. Not only that, He is my God. He's not a God who's aloof. Consider and answer me, O Lord my God, verse 2 says. He's not a God who's far away and distant. We call him by name, and he is the God with us. He's the God, my God. That's the first reason. He's a covenanting God, therefore he's a relational God. And second, we come to God in moments like this precisely because he is a sovereign God. The end of verse 2 says, How long shall my enemy be exalted over him? All these enemies are before him. All of these things are clouding him, and at the same time, he's confessing here that they are exalting over him. They're exalting over the psalmist. It's completely dependent upon God's decision. God decides how long his enemies will exalt over him. The psalmist isn't running away to other lords, other kings, other armies, and asking them, please cover me from my enemies. It's too much for me to handle. As if God is taken by surprises, as if God needs the help of any created thing to overcome one's enemies. God is absolutely sovereign, and the psalmist understands that God decides how long the enemies will exalt over him. We come to God because we know that behind our enemies, behind our worst circumstances, we have all the things that that's crumbling before us. It's a God who's completely in control of everything, unshaken, immovable, unchanging. God is sovereign, and he is for us. The third reason is the justice of God. God vindicates the righteous. Look at verse 4. He says, Lest my enemies say I have prevailed over him, lest my foes rejoice because I am shaken. Verse 4 is presupposing that the prevailing of his enemies before him is something that is completely unjust. The enemies are not supposed to prevail over him. The enemies are prevailing over him in an unrighteous manner. I am not supposed to be shaken. My foes are not rejoicing in the proper place and state. And God knows this. That's why when we turn to him, he, the psalmist understands God will vindicate the righteous. God will make sure that the only ones rejoicing are the ones who are supposed to be rejoicing. God will make sure that the only ones prevailing are the ones in the right. God is the God of vindication. God is the God of justification. Lord, consider and answer me. Bring me your attention. 
You know these false accusations. You know that they come veiled from me, over me, not because they are in the light. You know that they have been shooting accusations against me, and they are false. Lord, you see all things. You are sovereign. Lord, you are for me. I know you. Come and set things right. Who do we turn to in moments like this? What is it that we cling to? And that often we do for idols, isn't it? Maybe your career, maybe someone that you really trust outside of God, maybe your relationship, maybe your families, it may just be yourself. But the song is clear about the direction of the land. Bring it before the sovereign and holy God who's chosen to covenant with us. And this brings us to the third point, right? The power of the land. What is it that gives us strength? What is it that gives us the resources to cope with this powerful lament? The psalmist is not facing a small, anxious things in the middle of the night, right? He's not only thinking about his loneliness, he's not only facing guilt, he's not only facing external foes, whether in the form of death itself, physical enemies, or the devil. But all of these things combined. What gives us power in the man? And this is why verse 5 is absolutely key. Because on verse 5, there would be no hope. But, verse 1 to 4, it would bring us all these things that's almost overwhelming us, but verse 5 says, but. And this great turning point, he says, in spite of all this, through all this, in light of all this, I have trusted in your steadfast love. I have trusted in your steadfast love. And he says, my heart shall sing and rejoice in your salvation. I will sing to the Lord because he's dealt bountifully with me. This great transition brings us away from ourselves and now to God, because we always have to relate to God in light of ourselves and vice versa. It's never one or the other. He brings us back before God, and there's this great parallelism in verses 5 and 6. The first part of verse 5 talks about the character of God. The second part of verse 5 talks about the actions of God on the basis of that character. And that's repeated in verse 6. Verse 6 talks about his singing to the Lord, Yahweh in himself. He is the great I am, he's completely sovereign. And the second part of verse 6 is talking about God's acts and about who he is in. There's amazing parallelism there. God's character <coughs> is the ground for his actions. And what's the power of the lament? What is the song communicating to us here? The power of the lament is this remember God's character, trust in him, and remember his acts for you. Remember God's character, trust Him, and remember His acts for you. Remember the way He has bountifully dealt with you. Remember His amazing salvation on the basis of His unchangeable character. Remember all these things. This is why um, 17th century theologian Francis Turgeon, he's got this amazing treatise on predestination. And after he's talked about this whole um, complex theory of predestination, at the end of it, he outlines some practical, pastoral implications of the doctrine of predestination. And one of the things that struck me from this uh, treatment of it is he says this, predestination doesn't help us with the future, it helps us only with the present and the past. Because the doctrine of predestination doesn't help you plan for the future, it doesn't help you foresee anything as if predestination helps you, you know, uh, anticipate things that will come in the future. Predestination is a good and biblical and pastoral doctrine because predestination tells you that when you look back on your life, and when you look back at your history, and when you look back to the history of redemption in Scripture, what do you see? You see the faithful hand of an unchangeable and loving God who has planned everything for Jesus Christ and for your good. And when you look back and with the doctrine of predestination in hand, what do you see? God's plan is absolutely perfect. And in moments of lament, when you remember God's character and his acts, and you remember the doctrine of predestination, what you're supposed to be reminded of is everything turned out for the good. All things work out for good for all those who are in Christ, doesn't it? And so we're brought again to God's character and his actions. God is not only the God of steadfast love, he's unchangeable, he's a loving God, and that's the basis on which you rejoice in our salvation. 
that's the basis on which we, we anticipate our vindication before the accusers as well. We sing to the Lord. We, we engage in praise to God uh, himself. We proclaim his name precisely because he has dealt bountifully with us. He has dealt bountifully with us. The only way we can go to lament is if we remember who God is and what he's done for us. And I want us to consider this. Who is the God of steadfast love? Who is the God that brings salvation? Why is it that we can remember all these things, especially as Christians living after the New Testament, living after the Psalm has been written? How and why do we sing to the Lord? How has he dealt down to people? And this, he came down in the form of man. His name was Jesus Christ. He came, was born as a servant, obeyed God till the death, and he came to the Calvary, to the cross. And what did he do? He lamented from the garden to the cross, and he asked, How long, O Lord, take this cup away from me? Will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? My, my enemies are prevailing over me. How long, O Lord, will Will this end? Will this ever end? Will you be separated from me forever? And when he was on the cross, let me tell you something. He was truly separated from God the Father. His enemies truly prevailed over him. When he cried out to God in lament, nobody answered. Nobody answered. And for three days that went on. Death physical foes, the Pharisees, the Roman soldiers, Pontius Pilate all against him, the devil, making him sin, who himself knew no sin. Jesus Christ lamented on the cross. He cried out all these things that he wasn't answered, and only three days later was he vindicated by God, because God is a faithful and unchangeable God, so that today we can come before God, and we can lament before him, we can ask him how long oh Lord, will these accusations go on? And today we can hear his words. I am still with you, and I will never forsake you. Remember this beautiful thought, this unchangeable steadfast love of God. Jesus Christ died and died the death you should have died. He lived the life you should have lived. And because he was forsaken, because he lamented, because he truly did die the sleep of death. Can we now rise up and lament before God and know that the covenant of the Lord is with you and us? Let us pray. God, we are amazed and humbled at the way in which you've loved us. We remember our lives, we remember the past, we remember our conversion, or we remember who we are before we knew you, we remember the struggles that we have here today, and as we look back, Father, we are only reminded of the faithfulness of your hand that guides all things for our good and for your glory. We're reminded as well that you have taken up all of our sins. You who knew no sin, that we may be your people. That you who should be vindicated, like Jesus Christ, was not until three days later, so that we may be vindicated today in him. So, Father, help us. Help us be bold. Help us come before you. Help us be honest with our lamentation. Help us be honest with our sorrow. Help us be honest with our loneliness. And let us know when all these things for you, because we are an advocate. Amen. We're going to sing our final song. Uh, Can you praise 577 in your church?
up your heads and receive the blessing of the triune God. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God the Father and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. 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 Thank <laughs> you.